I'm Bob Mustin. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Edmondson, and you're very welcome. <laughs> we both had books published in 2020 by Atmosphere Press, and we're here to interview one another about our books. Actually, I think there's a certain symmetry to us doing this because Paul's an Englishman living in Ireland, uh, and he's written a book about a certain segment of American history. And I, on the other hand, am an American. Uh, who's written a fictional account of a man living through a pivotal time in European history. Paul was born in Safford, England, and has for many years lived in Waterford, Ireland. He's a founding member of the Waterford Writers Group there. As a poet, his work has been seen in publications such as uh, Deja Voices and Waterford Produced Anthology. He's also been published in other circulated literary organs. He's also a photographer, and his works have appeared on national televised media and in regional newspapers. Paul, this is your first uh, published piece that combines poetry and prose. Uh, what piqued your interest in a California Native American chief who went to war with the white world? That's a good question, and the, uh, the answer it came in a roundabout route, to be honest with you. Uh, I was in Yosemite National Park and Eastern Sierra uh, a couple of times, once, once in the fall and once in the spring. And I was there for, with my camera to take photographs. Um, but wherever I was uh, taking photographs and the locations, I would make a note of where I was. Um, and when I got back home, I would then do some research uh, on the subject matter that I'd been photographing. Um, and one of these photographs was, was of a mountain right in Yosemite Valley. Uh, which had three peaks, and it was called the Three Brothers. Uh, and when I got back home, my research to find out why was you know what what is this Three Brothers and why was it called that, um, and it was research there that I found that the Three Brothers were named after three sons of a chief called Tanaya, uh, who lived in the valley uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I just followed through upon the history because that's the time of the gold rush. So there's conflict between white settlers and Native American indi indigenous groups that were living in and around that area at that time. So that's what piqued my interest. And I followed through with the history and then wrote a novel that, su that surrounded the historical events that were happening at the time. So that's how it came about. Uh, Chief Tanaya that you wrote about uh, seems a pretty unique character, pretty inventive too in his dealings with the white people. Uh, would you tell us uh, a little bit about him and give some of his background? Yeah, he, he, he was a character, undoubtedly. And uh, it's because I fell in love with that character that, that, that the book streamed out. Uh, he was actually born uh, near Mono Lake. Um, his father, who was chief before him, uh, had brought his people out of Yosemite Valley, uh, I suppose, towards the end of the late 18th century because of what they call the Black Sickness. Uh, which was decimating his people. Uh, and before they vanished completely because of this um, epidemic, um, he took them across the Sierra Nevada and joined their, what you could call cousins, I suppose, the Paiute people who were living in and around Mono Lake. And it was there that he married uh, a squaw of the Paiute people. Uh, and their son, Tanaya, was born there. So that's that's where Tanaya was born. Um, when his father died, the shaman uh, advised Tanaya to take his people back into Yosemite Valley to assume um, his position as chief of the Awaniches and to go back into the valley. And that's exactly what he did. So there were an order of about 300 people crossed back over the Sierra Nevada and resettled back in what's now known as Yosemite Valley. Um, it was during the mid 19th century uh, after they'd been living there for a few decades, that the gold rush happened. And because of the gold rush and the white settlers, that brought a lot of conflict, as we know, between white settlers uh, and the native indigenous groups that were living in California, Northern California, which would have included eventually the Awaniches. Um, as far as the Awaniche tribes concerned uh, and his and Tanaya's people, uh, there wasn't a great deal recorded 
Uh, so I've had to go back into history and try and, it's a fiction after all, so I've had to try and imagine the situation, imagine him. For example, I could only find two names of the whole Awanichi people. That was Tanai himself and his granddaughter, Tortuya. So it is a fiction. Um, I've imagined um, a lot of the building of the people, him and his people, and the conflict uh, with the white settlers. But I've based it around two historical events and whatever was recorded about Tanaya himself, which was through uh, a soldier particularly who was with the Mariposa Indian, um, the, who was present at the Mariposa Indian War. So, um, but he was obviously quite a wily character, a crafty character in a lovable way, I found, um, but very brave. A uh, very tough person. So, yeah, that's that's my take on uh, Tanaya. I, I I love writing about him. Right. Yeah, he's uh, really an inventive person. Um, his conflict uh, begins in your book, uh, at least in part, with a man named James Savage, who's also a fairly unique character. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about him and the? Uh, Mariposa Indian War that he and Tanaya were involved in? Yeah, um, James Savage, uh, again, I would say, was a larger than life character, literally, and, and the way he affected people. Uh, he was a very big man. Um, he was one of six children um, born in Indianapolis of a pioneering American family. Uh, they moved to Lock near uh, New York where he met and married Elisa. Um, but he was obviously a, a very restless man. And together with his pregnant wife, uh, his brother Morgan, uh, they joined uh, a wagon train in Independence in Missouri. Um, a six month journey, um, 2000 miles across to California, Sonora in California. Um, you can imagine back to the 1840s, that sort of journey was, was just horrendous across the rivers, um, across mountainous terrain, um, disease, across deserts. Anyway, before they got to Sonora, um, his wife gave birth to a daughter, uh, and very sadly, um, they both died within 24 hours. So that's that's the way he arrived into Sonora. At that time, there was co there was a war going on between the Americans and the Mexicans uh, about the possession of what came to be known as California. So he joined the California Battalion and fought in that war. But it was while he was at Sutter's Fort where gold was discovered, and that brought about the whole of the gold rush and the influx of thousands and thousands and thousands of people into that part of the world. Although he was poorly educated, he was um, quite a, a, an amazing person in terms of pulling people around him. He was very influential with people. He set up uh, gold diggings. He set up provision stores for the thousands of people that were coming in. So he proved to be himself uh, not only a very uh, astute business person, but he was also integrated very well with certain of the Native American indigenous groups that were there at the time. He had hundreds of people working for him. Uh, he took some of their um, people strategically, squaws as wives strategically, to enhance his situation, learn their language, learn their ways. Quite an amazing character. They came to know him as Chief Yellowhair. But that brought about conflict, the white settlers, conflict with indigenous groups who'd had their land stolen, um, their food sources stolen directly or indirectly. Um, and they Indian, certain indigenous groups retaliated, uh, stole from his stores, stole the horses, stole his wives. And of course, one of these groups had to be the Awaniches, who were secreted away at that time in Yosemite Valley. The Mariposa, was, the Mariposa Battalion was formed uh, to, to correct this situation, if you like, uh, and Savage was their colonel in chief. So they were the ones uh, at the end of 1950 and going into 1950, waged the Mariposa Indian War, which is the first time that white people had actually gone into Yosemite Valley. Um, so that's that's it. They, they came in direct conflict with Chief Tanaya and the Awaniches. Uh, and as I say, that's, that's where my fiction is built around that whole history. Um, 
It is a fiction, but I've tried to be true and honest to the historical facts at that particular time uh, and indeed to the indigenous groups that were, were living and especially the Awaniches. So that's that's how the story unfolds. Right. Um, when most people here think of uh, Native Americans, it's usually about the Plains Indians or maybe the Pueblos that lived in the great Southwest. Uh, the California tribes and Tanayas people in particular aren't very widely known, I think. Uh, why do you suppose that is, Paul? That's a good question, Bob, and, and I can only surmise. But I think maybe um, because at their maximum size, there was probably less than 500 people. And they did cloister themselves within Yosemite Valley, which is pretty enclosed area. So they sort of kept themselves to themselves, um, you know, apart from integrating with their near neighbours, especially the Paiutes at Mono Lake. Um, and after the Mariposa Indian War, um, no Awaniches ever lived in the valley again. Maybe a few years afterwards, but they, they eventually were were all driven out, despite the wiliness and um, of Chief Tanaya and his way to talk himself out of situations. Um, they eventually were removed from from the valley, and either died, disappeared, or were integrated into other groups that were living in the area. So I suppose by the time the 1960s, 1970s, there were no Awaniches actually living in their territory. So I think that's probably why. That's my, that would be the way I would suppose the situation uh, turned out to be. So I, I think that's the reason. Yeah, it sounds uh, probably very true. There's quite a few uh, uh, situations in cultural groups in the United States that uh, didn't get well known. So uh, Paul, I think your book is gonna be a great addition to the canon of books about the development of the West. Paul, where can readers find your book? Um, well, they can find it on my own website, of course, where, where if people do order it from there, uh, I will post it out to them and I indeed sign copies. So that's pauledmondsonauthor.com. Um, and deliveries are still happening to the States, believe it or not, from Ireland. So despite the pandemic, um, but it's also unavailable on the likes of Amazon and Book Depository, Barnes and Noble, uh, Bookstore. Indie bound, so it's it's quite widely available. Thanks, Paul. Um, now we're going to turn the tables, and Paul gets to ask me a few questions. Paul, okay, yeah, many thanks, Bob. Uh, as you say, it's now my turn to throw a few questions your way. Um, but before we discuss your latest novel, Gerbert's book, maybe you would tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you live in Asheville, North Carolina. Yes, I, I lived here for almost 20 years. Uh, I grew up in a military family and traveled around quite a bit. Uh, in fact, I had a brief military career. Uh, it just wasn't for me. Uh, so I decided to build things instead of blow things up, you might say. <laughs> and uh, had a civil engineering career for quite a few years. And uh, since I retired and my wife and I are living here in that, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and I've dedicated these years of my life to writing. Yeah, you've um, you've written and published 15 books of very different genres, uh, such as short story, memoir, suspense, and of course, historical fiction. So you obviously have a long and deep love for writing. Where, where did this love stem from? I think it started for me when I was a little kid. I wrote my first story uh, when I was about eight years old, dicta dictated it to my mother. <laughs> it was a blatant ripoff of uh, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, but uh, I considered it mine. The, the actual written part of that disappeared somewhere. I wish I had it, but it's not there. But I think people, um, somebody once said that they're, three types of people. There's the the leaders, there's the followers, and, the, and then there's the watchers. And I'm one of the watchers, the ones that just want to watch things go by and try to document them. So uh, somehow that got into my DNA, I suppose, and that's how I write. Uh, that's good. 
That's good. Obviously, over the years, you've uh, you've honed your skills. So, how and where did you hone these skills? Um, there, there's kind of a rule of thumb I came across that you, uh, to be com- a competitive writer, you're going to have to write, 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 uh, attend uh, writing workshops, uh, critique groups, uh, hopefully find a mentor to help you. And uh, I've done all of that. Uh, it usually takes 10 to 20 years to really develop your skills to be competitive these days because there's so many good writers out there. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's probably very encouraging, I suppose, for aspiring writers. Um, you've just got to get your head down. As a friend of mine would say, if you want to write, you've got to write. Um, okay, so let's turn to Gerbert's story, your recent release. Uh, which I th- absolutely thoroughly enjoyed the read. I thought it was a fantastic read. Uh, it's a host- historical fiction set in Europe around the turn of the first millennium, and it follows the intrigues of the Catholic Church and its religious and political aspirations. The novel very much reminds me of Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, and personally, I think it's right up there alongside this classic. So I think it's a just just an amazing book. Uh, but tell me, where, where did the inspiration for the novel come from? Um, a friend uh, told me about this character one time, just in a conversation about interesting people. And part of my interest in writing is to find uh, interesting people that aren't very well known and to kind of bring them to life and uh you know, kind of flesh out their lives, what's uh, what's actually uh, written about them. And as you said about your book, there's quite a bit about Joubert that uh, is not known. Of course, there wasn't that many things documented back then. Uh, so there's quite a few places that in his life that you have to invent things. And uh, that's really the red meat for writers anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, it's an interesting format that you've put the book in. You've put it in the form of testimonials by Gerbert, Zosimus, and Theodore. Uh, three, well, two particularly, but three characters within your book. Um, maybe you'd tell the views how you, how, you, how you chose this format, why you chose that format, and a little bit about these characters and how they fit in with, with the events at the time through the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. Um, well, actually, the truth is that I kind of wrote myself into a corner with this. Uh, it was, it's a story about Gerbert and uh, his friend Zosimus. Uh, Gerbert eventually became the first French pope, and that part was easy. Uh, it's actually a book within a book, and uh, I had to invent Theodore in order to carry on the story after Zosimus and Bear, uh, their roles ended in the book. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much how that came about. Uh, this was one of those cases where I wrote myself into a corner and actually got out of the corner. <laughs> I think what it, what it does, if I may say, Bob, is that it authenticates the book, which I think is a huge compliment to yourself to be able to do that from us from a story of Gerbert and then fictionalize around that but you, it's so believable and I think that's say why it's up there as a classic uh, just just curious do you see any parallels between you know the, the the religious and political intrigues at that time and and, and, and today's world yes actually I do uh, this was the, the turn of the millennium uh, and people in Europe particularly, were afraid that the world was going to end when uh, the year 1000 rolled along, sort of similar to some of the uh, angst we had here with uh, the year 2000 when it it came about. I know I was still working then, and uh, we were afraid all the computers were going to crash. But uh, it was a time of change. Uh, We're certainly in a time of change now. Whether you like it or not, things are changing in quite a few ways. Uh, We're kind of at an end point, maybe, uh, of the way religion and society, uh, the secular society, have 
interacted. Uh, and it was certainly the case then. Joubert uh, actually came to co-rule uh, the Holy Roman Empire with Otto III, the German emperor at the time. Uh, certainly that's uh, not something we would uh, draw a direct parallel to with our time now, but I think the politics, the religious and spiritual end of things here is changing and everything in between. Uh, it's, just, it's fascinating to draw the parallels. Um, okay, Gerbert's book was published in April. Where can viewers find it? Um, you can find it on my website, which is not, not under my name. It's under uh, my publishing company. My, I have my own publishing company. It's uh, gridleyfires.com. That's three words put together as one. Uh, it's also on Amazon, of course, and on, on the uh, Atmosphere Press uh, website. Um, hopefully, it'll be available sometime soon in bookstores as well. That's great. Thank, thanks a million, Bob. Much appreciate. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're, we're, we're both very proud of our publications, and it's very interesting, the parallels between the two publications uh, by Atmosphere Press. Um, and to our viewers there, we're, we're sure that you and your reading friends will enjoy reading these two books. So whatever else, spread the word. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll catch up with you again. Thanks a million. Thank you all. Okay.